In the last webcast, we identified three key questions that we'll have to address to fully specify the structure of lactose. First of all, we need to determine which sugar, glucose or galactose, is connected through its anomeric hydroxyl group. Recall that the fact that the disaccharide was cleaved under acidic hydrolysis conditions implies that at least one anomeric hydroxyl group must be involved in the glycosidic linkage. Assuming that only one anomeric group is involved, we can imagine two possibilities, which I've specified for us here. Notice that both possibilities possess two unique anomeric positions, because one is involved in the glycosidic linkage, while the other is free. The bottom line is that we need a way to distinguish the hemiacetal functional group belonging to the free anomeric position from the acetal functional group involved in the glycosidic linkage. What chemistry can we use to distinguish these two functional groups? They are different, but it may not be clear at first glance what sort of conditions might apply to the hemiacetal but not to the acetal. Try pausing the video now and think about a reaction that might modify a hemiacetal without touching an acetal. If you noticed that the hemiacetal has the ability to open to a carbonyl compound, nicely done. Just like the hemiacetal in cyclic monosaccharides, hemiacetals in polysaccharides can also open to form carbonyl compounds. An acidic proton is essential for this process because the reaction represents an elimination of H and OR. Thus, the acetal functional group, which lacks an acidic proton, is unable to open to form a carbonyl group. Looking at the half-open form of this disaccharide, we see that treating with an oxidant selective for aldehydes, an aqueous solution of bromine, would transform the lone carbonyl group to a carboxylic acid. Subsequent acidic hydrolysis produces two monosaccharides, only one of which has been oxidized. The unoxidized sugar, we can be sure now, was linked through its anomeric position. In practice, mild oxidation of lactose, followed by acidic hydrolysis, yields oxidized glucose, or gluconic acid, and pristine galactose. This tells us that galactose must be linked through its anomeric position. Which hydroxyl group in glucose is involved in the glycosidic linkage? This is our second key question to address. Let's again examine a reference disaccharide structure. What is unique about the oxygen atom involved in the glycosidic linkage? For one thing, it's not part of a hydroxyl group and does not possess an acidic hydrogen atom. In the presence of base, we may be able to selectively harness the nucleophilicity of the free hydroxyl groups in order to identify all the positions in glucose that are not part of the glycosidic linkage. In the presence of base and the epic electrophile dimethyl sulfate, SN2 substitution takes place to install methyl ethers at each position where a hydroxyl group existed originally. What's next? Acidic hydrolysis cleaves the disaccharide and reveals the hydroxyl groups that were not free. That is, the hydroxyl groups involved in the glycosidic linkage. Notice that the anomeric positions are also hydrolyzed to hemiacetals. This is to be expected because the anomeric methyl ethers present after methylation can be protonated and displaced by water via an oxocarbenium ion intermediate. That's why our first experiment, which pinned down which anomeric positions were involved in the glycosidic linkage, was necessary. At any rate, hydrolysis reveals a hydroxyl group at the 4 position in glucose, telling us that this position must have been involved in the glycosidic linkage in lactose. We're almost home free, but one more question remains. What's the stereochemistry of the glycosidic linkage? In particular, does the anomeric position of galactose possess the alpha or beta configuration? We can't learn the configuration in lactose by analyzing the products of acidic hydrolysis because the hydrolysis conditions epimerize the anomeric carbon through mutarotation. There is a straightforward solution, however. We can treat the sugar with an enzyme that cleaves disaccharides, also known as a glycosidase enzyme. These are selective for either alpha or beta anomers. Glycosidases cleave the glycosidic bond and add the elements of water to the disaccharide, yielding two monosaccharides. Only a beta glycosidase 
leads to the cleavage of lactose. This tells us that the anomeric carbon of galactose within lactose must have had the beta configuration. With this information in hand, we can fully specify the structure of lactose. The past two webcasts have introduced you to the process of structural elucidation of disaccharides. To review, recall that there were three key questions to answer to fully solve the structure of lactose. Which anomeric positions are involved in the glycosidic linkage? What non-anomeric hydroxyl groups are involved? And what's the configuration of the anomeric position or positions involved in the glycosidic linkage? To address these questions, we used mild oxidation with aqueous bromine, exhaustive methylation followed by hydrolysis, and differential glycosidase reactivity, respectively. In the next webcast, we'll investigate the mechanisms of glycosidase enzymes.